It's really interesting that before Nelson Mandela was incarcerated, he was known as the Black Pimpernel because the authorities couldn't find him. He was so clever and skilled and he was able to travel across and around Africa and connect with other liberation struggles in North Africa, for instance, whether it was Tunisia and elsewhere. And he even came to Britain in the early 1960s. There's a very famous picture of him standing out outside Westminster as a young man. Now, there's still a lot of that history that we don't know about. When he was here, who did he connect with? We know that he saw key white, mostly Labour politicians, but who were the black community members and activists that he met here? But even after he went back to South Africa and he was caught and incarcerated, when the ANC itself, which has positioned itself as the main liberation movement, and the PAC were banned and fled into exile, they both found a home here in Britain. The ANC primarily was supported by the anti-apartheid movement, where the PAC was, was supported by many black activists, black panther, black nationalist movements here in Britain. So the ANC and the PAC continue to compete for support from the black community here, as well as the broader community. That is still very much a hidden history that is now being unfolded. My book, The Politics of Race in Britain and South Africa, talks about the tensions that existed between these two liberation groups, both here in Britain as well as in South Africa. It talks about the tension, but it also maps it onto black politics in Britain at that time. Why did some members of the black community support the ANC, while others preferred to support the PAC? The ANC followed a policy called multiracialism, where it saw South Africa at the end of apartheid as being inclusive for all people, black and white. However, the PAC had a vision of a black majority led South Africa, but with whites in a minimal role or almost no role at all. In many respects, the PAC was seen as a racist group. In Britain in the 1970s and 80s, in reaction to the racism here, many black activist groups disassociated themselves from the anti-apartheid movement because it refused, at least publicly, to support the armed struggle, whereupon many black ind independent groups here did support the armed struggle. It's really interesting that the competition between the ANC and the PAC in South Africa became transposed when they came to Britain. And whereupon the ANC was supported by the anti-apartheid movement, which fully backed and supported its non-racialism, the PAC was supported by black nationalist groups here in Britain, such as the Black Action for the Liberation of South Africa and the All African Revolutionary Party and many others. What I'm trying to say is that there's a very stark division in Britain in the 1970s and 80s in terms of how to deal with racism. Do you meet it? Fire with fire? Or do you have a more inclusive approach? That is one of the lessons that even today we can learn from. Who do you bring along in this fight for justice and human rights? Surely, if there's one thing that Nelson Mandela's life teaches us, is that there's room for everyone and there should be a respect for human rights across the broad sweep of humanity. That is why the South African constitution is one of the most wide ranging in the world in terms of diversity and equality.